very much. teacher I was at Falls High School. I teach a course of law in the Second World War. And uh, part of our mission is to collect as many stories from World War II generations as we can. So well, we're here today with Sonny Segan. I've actually spoken to him before. Several years ago I went over to his house and uh, did a two-hour interview with him. I've actually spoken to him before and uh, did a two-hour interview with him. I've had him over at the high school uh, with a seminar of other World War II uh, people who were in the U.S. Army Air Corps. He was on a panel there. And this is the third time I've had the opportunity to speak with him. So today I'd like to ask him a few questions <coughs> and uh, get his story of the Second World War. Um, so I'm going to start now. Sonny, can you tell me uh, when were you born? What's your date of birth? I was born December the 5th, 1922. Where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn, New York. On the kitchen of our apartment. Boss. In those days you didn't have the birth that you have today. Uh, it was in a very tough neighborhood in Brooklyn, Brownsville. That's where Murder Incorporated came from, and I was brought up there. Did you have brothers and sisters? I was the youngest of three children. I had two sisters. What did your dad or your mom do uh, for a living? Well, those were the bad years that I remember, the Depression years. And uh, my father was partners with a couple other guys in the men's clothing business, small business. And they had to go out of business, so he moved it into our house in Brooklyn. The dining room became the stock room and the basement became the cutting room. My father was a very hard worker. He would put it in like 14, 15 hours a day. And he would be on the road and weekends he would work in the house to make the cuttings done. And uh, eventually he was able to move to Manhattan. And uh, he made a living, but uh, he was never really very good at it. I worked at, when I went to high school, and then I was on early session, every afternoon I would go and work in his loft in New York City. From the time I was like 13 and a half, 14. And, uh, but in those days, and a lot of you remember those days, uh, we'd go around collecting paper and uh, looking for deposit bottles and things. Make a few cents, we were very happy because it was the Depression years and they were not good. Uh, my life has changed. I've had a wonderful life. And one of the things that made my life wonderful, my life wonderful, was not. Living the war, because actually I didn't live the war. I'm, you're talking to a dead man. I have a letter here. Does everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Good. I have a letter here from the Veterans Administration, and it says the Veterans Administration is going to regret the death of the above named veteran, <laughs> and my name is there. <laughs> so you. Listening to a dead man. <laughs> this came on September the 19th, 1944. I was shut down June 28th, 1944, in a plane that we shouldn't have been flying in. Our plane was being repaired after a very bad mission. And 
they put us in a plane that was in worse shape than that plane. Can I ask you a couple questions about sure. that? Um, can I see that letter first? So I don't remember seeing this before. Um, I just want to go back for a minute and ask you, uh, do you remember, you know, just to bring us into the World War II part, do you remember where you were on December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was bombed? Uh, December the 7th, 1941, I was an assistant scoutmaster. And I had Troop 280 in Brooklyn, Brownsville, on a camping trip in Coitsville, New Jersey, which is near Englewood. And a forest ranger came into the where we were camping and said, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, we're going to be at war now. And all my 11, 12 year olds started saying, Yay, oh boy, we're going to be at war. They were used to playing war. And I sat them down and I had a long talk with them. And I explained to them that their brothers, their older brothers and their uncles and their fathers might have to go in and they might get hurt. But I didn't reach them. When we came back that night on the George Washington Bridge, there were armed guards with fixed bayonets on the bridge. And they saw that and they realized what's going on and they were quiet on the subway all the way home. I tried to get into the service right afterwards, but I needed my parents' signature and they wouldn't give it to me until I, they wanted me to wait until I had to sign up for the draft. So I went and I worked as a laborer on the Pentagon building, building it. I was almost killed with that. The pipe came down from the third floor and hit me on the head. Whoa. And then when they realized I'd have to register for the draft in another few months, they allowed me to enlist in the Army Air Corps as an aviation cadet. When I went to it, you had to either have two years of college or pass a test that was equivalent to two years of college. Right after that, maybe three, four, or five months later, they found that they couldn't get guys passed in the test. So they sent them to colleges for six months and then they put them in the cadet program. And most of the cadets washed out. I say out of a hundred cadets, you have like uh, 55, 60, 65 washed out. Naked. <coughs> I have a very close friend that did that. I say he's dead now. We were friends for 80 years. He was a forward observer in the artillery in Galveston, Texas. And he was going to be going overseas. And I met him in Houston, Texas. And I told him, your jobs are very dangerous when you're going to try and get into the cadets. And he did, and he went to college for six months. But then he washed out, and he became a uh, ball turret gunner and flew out of India, which wasn't too bad. My, I was young. I was only 21 when I got shut down. <coughs> June 28, 1944. Where were you? You were flying out of Africa? I flew, well, first I started in Africa, North in Africa, Tunis. Your bombing missions were to where? Italy. I flew from a small town in Italy. And you were going to Romania? Blasti? Well, that was the, we went all over. We went in, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Northern Italy were involved in quite a few of the things. How many targets? 26 missions. Is that the question? 26 missions? Um, and you were a bombardier. You were trained as a bombardier? I was a bombardier. I was a, uh, when I got shut down, I was a second lieutenant, then I became a first lieutenant. Seven men in my crew got killed. Six are in one grave. When the alarm went to bail out, I put my shoe on and I opened the door for my nose turret gunner, handed him his shoot, and I went to where the nose wheel is and to bail out. And the 
mine went into a dive at 13,000 feet. All the way. To the ground. And I was holding on, trying to get out, and I couldn't get out. And I said, I'll be quick. I won't feel it. I'll be dead. I don't want to die. And I still don't know how I got out. I think Buck and I, on my nose turret gun, I was six foot two, and he was a big, strong guy. He was right behind me. He might have given me that little push. And I got out of the plane, and I, I was going to go. I was happy that I was going to wait to get past the plane to pull the chute so I wouldn't get tangled with the plane. And the chute went up, and I looked up. And then I looked down, and I was going into the flames of the plane. And I climbed the chute, hit the ground, smashed my left leg, my tibia, or the tibia led the two bones in your body were that far apart. Eventually, when I got back to the States, I had a, I had a bone graft from my right leg into my left leg. At a 10 men, seven of the dead, six or one grave, 135 pounds out of 200 is buried in Belgium. Peterson, our engineer, he was going out the window, the waste window. He and the radio operator manned handguns. I think I have a 50 caliber machine gun bullet here someplace. It's in my they that big. We all use 50 caliber machine guns, except me. And I did go to gunnery school, and I was an expert at it. I was the best in the crew, but it wasn't my job then. I had to stand up in where the bombardier would be, and we had a thing, and I'd call out that 3 o'clock and M.A. 109, Nine o'clock, two more coming in, so they would know where to move their guns and their turrets. What kind of formation did you fly? We flew 18 ships, six, six, and six. They were stacked. Right. And that was our protection, because if you have 10 machine guns on each P-24, when you have six, that's 60. When you have 18, that's 180. With the 50 caliber machine gun. 50 caliber machine guns. John, you got the bullets in the uh, thing, my thing? Where's my... Uh... It should be in there. John's my son. Can you see it? That's a fair Wow. It's a big round. So, can you tell me a little bit, you know, as a bombardier, your job was to get to the IP, the initial point? Right. And then, did you take over the aircraft? I would take the aircraft over. My, my uh, bomb site would be able to move the aircraft either right, left, up, down, check the speed. It was connected to the plane. And you would work your machine, your bomb site, the Norton or the Sperry bomb site, and it would move the, the plane in the right direction and it would release the bombs to hit the target. We hit our targets were very well. The British flew at night and they would just drop their bombs. They couldn't see the targets. But we did see the targets and we did precision bombing. But the Northern bomb site was better than the Sperry bomb site, but they were both very, very good. Uh, you had to put the right information in, your airspeed, your altitude, your, and all the things that went with the bomb dropping from 20,000 or 19,000 or 22,000 feet. Your airspeed, so when it took off, it would take off fast and then slow down and then go down. We bombed cities. A 
And every mission I went on, we would have a briefing early in the morning, like at 5.36 in the morning, and go on our mission. And the, whoever gave you the briefing, the colonel, would say, and if you can't see the target, hit the town. So when you're at 20,000 and 22,000 feet and 24,000 feet, you don't see people. When I was a prisoner of war, I knew what it was because we were bombed by the British and the Americans. And then when we were freed because Romania went and capitulated and went over to the Allies, Germany carabombed Bucharest for three days and three nights, and they killed more people than we did in the war. And I was there. So I was in an air raid shelter. And the first night I slept in the basement of the hospital that I was in. And then I went into an air raid shelter, and there were like eight, nine of us, and they started to leave, and I was left all alone. We had one set of crutches in our ward. We also had one bed pan, too. <laughs> Very big, big, clean bed pan. As a matter of fact, one night I haven't had my shorts cut off for me. I was asking for somebody to bring me. I was a bed patient. I couldn't get up. I had a bed pan and nobody heard me. And I had dysentery. Or maybe dysentery and uh, it was not a pleasant thing. I had a cast on my leg with fleas in it, lice. And I have a wire hanger opened up with a piece of cotton with alcohol trying to kill them. The food was terrible. When I came out of prison camp, I weighed 99 pounds. And the worst thing happened to me when I came out of prison camp. I was in Barry, Italy, after three days and three nights of bombings, and then the 15th Air Force made arrangements for two days to take us home. 3,781 men got shot down, 1,185 came home. It took them two days to fly us out, and we had the fighter planes up above the P-51 Mustangs, and the P-49s and the P-38s flying above so we could be safe. I was very happy. I came to Barry, Italy. I was going to go home. And all of a sudden, about the third day I was there, a young kid from my block came in. I said, how did you know I was here? He says, I've been, your parents have been writing to me. Oh, yeah, how's my mother and father? And he didn't know it, but I wasn't told. He says, your mother died from the telegram you ever seen that. No. I'm so That still has Bob Shoot. My mother was fifty one. She had high blood pressure. I made arrangements to have the telegram or something be shut down to be sent to my father where he worked. But it was July 4th, we did. And we went through the trouble to find out where I was. my mother was and they sent it there and she had a cerebral hemorrhage and died. I didn't have a good life. I came back out of prison camp. I came home to Brooklyn. My father remarried. He then four days after I came home, three months and ten days after my mother died, and his new wife wouldn't let me live with them. She had a daughter, 16 years old. She was afraid I would have sex with her daughter. I don't think I would have, not because she wouldn't want me to, but because I didn't want to. <laughs> I lived in furnished rooms. I 
and I had hot times. I am an alcoholic. March the third, I will have forty nine years. Alcoholics Anonymous. My drinking got so bad. I have what they call post traumatic war syndrome. I've been in VA hospitals, in side wards, been in straight jackets, picked up in Bellevue Hospital in New York, picked up Kings County Hospital in New York. I lost my wife and children because of my drinking, which was the right thing for my wife to do, because that made me start to think. I had blackouts like you wouldn't believe. One still bothers me, I can't remember it. I took a room in Meriden, Connecticut. I was a road salesman in those days. And I woke up in New Haven, and I don't remember going there. I wake up in hotels in Manhattan, from Brooklyn after I was drinking. But that I took a cab or the subway. My drinking got very bad. I had blackouts like you wouldn't believe. After I was in the block ward at the VA hospital on First Avenue and 26th Street, a couple of days I got over my drinking and I started to think, I said, every time I get a pass and I get drunk, I don't even remember what happened. I had blackouts. Maybe I'm an alcoholic. I had post-traumatic war syndrome. I had very bad. Seven men of my crew got killed, six in one grave. I got out a second before the plane hit the ground. I smashed my tibia and fibula. I was put into, taken to a Russian hospital. They wanted to put me in with the Russians. When they heard I was an officer, the Romanians said, oh no, we can't put him in with the Russians. He's an officer. The officers in the Romanian army were the second and third sons of the nobility. First one got the Duke or Count title. So they put me in a room with a officer from the Romanian army. And the doctor would come in and he'd say to me, Chief Fox gangster, pourquoi me tirailler his enfants and femmes in trains? Why do you machine gun women and children in trains? There were also soldiers at the trains and arms and material to kill Americans. He had me walking on my leg that was separated like that and it went together. When they got to me, Bucharest, French doctor who was interned, took an x-ray of the leg and saw what happened. And he laid me on the table, and he had six guys from downstairs, big guys. Three on each side of me, holding me down, didn't give me anything because we didn't have anything. And he really broke my leg and he put me in a special cast and pulled it out. As a matter of fact, the doctors and United States, when I came back to the States, couldn't get over it. I came back on a hospital ship, USS Refuge, for 15 days. And it was a nice trip. Can I ask you, I just want to back up for a second. But sure, go right ahead. Interrupt me, because I talk too much. Well, I just want to try and piece things together a little bit. Um, going back to... Uh, the Russians. I guess I'm kind of interested because you said Romania capitulated and they switched sides, and that you were a prisoner of war, so you got to actually experience, unfortunately, a lot of the bombing that took place, particularly the terror bombing by the Germans. But I guess my question is, do you remember when the Russians came through? I mean, were they the ones who the actually Russians liberated you? The Russians never came to us. The Russians, I never even met any of them. When we go on missions, and if your plane was in trouble in that area, they'd say, get to Turkey, don't get to Russia, because you'll be interned in a prison. The best place was Switzerland. Guys that were 
flying over Austria and parts of Germany would try and make it to Switzerland if their plane wasn't going to make it back to Italy. We were 18 planes in the squadron, four squadrons in a group. And I was in North Africa and the guys were coming home who had finished their missions and I asked how many made it, two, three, one, two, three. We went over with green painted OD planes, all <coughs> drab, and toward, just before I got shut down, I would look out my windows in the plane and it would all be aluminum, silver, because they realized the paint, paint on the planes weighed a lot. And it cut back on their fuel oil and their speed. So they stopped painting the planes all of drab. And there was, out of 18 planes, many times I was the only one that was silver. And I said, geez, I'm going to make it. Somebody always makes it. <laughs> well, you had 20, 26 missions. That's pretty incredible. Why well, you have to have 50? You had to have 50? 50 missions when you flew out of Italy. In England, you only needed 25 or anywhere. Was it the distance? Or the it was the distance. We flew, some of the missions we flew were not hard. We hit a target in uh, Italy called Valmontone which makes this area look like a big city. It was a tiny little town on top of a mountain. And we couldn't understand why we were going to bomb there. When the bombs hit the ground, you wouldn't believe the explosions. The Germans had their munitions there. And I'm talking about black smoke coming up to 18, 20,000 feet. I'm talking about explosions that you couldn't believe. But then we knew why we hit that target. Uh, I bought Anzio, which was a rough place to be for the Americans, because the Germans were up on a cliff and the Americans had to land on the beach. Reef. Do you remember Monte Cassino? You probably weren't at on Monte Cassino, the monastery. Yes. Do you remember about that? Yes. I was up on top. It's a similar situation. They sent the bombers from England. <coughs> we <coughs> were scared a lot, but we wouldn't say it. <coughs> My ball turret gunner, Horace Aloysius O'Connor Jr., who's dead, he's buried in group burial in Nebraska. He tried to shoot his leg, and he hit it a little bit because he didn't want to have to fly anymore. He was scared. He was a staff sergeant at the time. He was busted out to private, and he, he was right. He did die. Self-inflicted wound. Pardon? The self-inflicted wound. He didn't the wound. He right. died from the admission that right. he even just touched it barely. A lot of guys did that, though. Yes. Uh, some guys just couldn't take it. They got scared stiff and they were afraid of it. The neighborhood I came from in Brooklyn, you didn't get scared because it was a tough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. you, you, most of you are old enough to remember the name Murder Incorporated. Lefty, Garaj Shapiro, Abe Rellis. I lived in that neighborhood where they practiced their gangsterism. And uh, it was a tough neighborhood. How long were you actually a prisoner of war? How many just, months? Just two and a half months. And, uh, I wouldn't have made it if it had been like eight, nine, ten months, because uh, I was down to 99 pounds. When they weren't feeding you well at all? No. Weren't taking care of you properly? They gave you fish heads. Mama Liga, which was a corn mush. The ice cold and you could lift it up and you couldn't hardly bite into it. They treated us very poorly. 
But I was happy to be with the Americans. I had been with the Romanians for a while until they found out I was Jewish and they shook me out. Why is that? Because they're anti-Semitic. Very much so. Very much so. Very much so. I found that out the minute I got into that room and I never told them, but then eventually the a nurse who was a nun brought in a picture of Jesus Christ and hung it on the wall and my Romanian office of roommate says, Papa Roma? And I didn't answer him. He kept repeating it and finally I said, Jewish, I'm Jewish. The next day they shipped me to Bucharest, which was good. I was with my friends, my Americans. Uh, I think I told her about how I didn't make it to a bedpan one night and I had to cut my shorts off me. Mm -hmm. I got a letter from a guy from uh, the city that uh, Truman came from. Missouri? Missouri. That's the city of Missouri. He uh, had the next bed to me and he cut my shorts off from me. He's dead now. Most of the people that I served with are dead now. Those who did live, those who were in prison camp with me. As a matter of fact, the last, I belong to a uh, group called the Romanian Prisoners of War, and there's so few of us left now. The sons have taken over, and daughters are running the meetings because there are very few of us left. Well, I was young. I was 21 when I got shut down. I'm 86 now. Guy who was 25 is, uh, was four years older. He's 90. Do you remember, can I ask you if you remember, do you remember when the war ended in, in Europe? When the war ended in Europe, I had been in the United States for quite a while. Yeah. They were using me, they couldn't do anything about my leg until they finally gave me a bone graft from my right leg to my left leg. And they did an excellent job. No screws, no plate perfect fit. As a matter of fact, the captain who did the operation, Captain Michael, became a major right after that. The x-rays went to Walter Reed Hospital. And uh, I did a lot of PT, physical therapy. When I was at Butler, Pennsylvania, after my operation, before they moved me to Pauling Air Force Convalescent Hospital in New York City, New York State, all of a sudden, the chaplain, the rabbi, is sitting next to me for lunch, dinner, lunch, dinner. And after about three, four days, he says, Dad, what's going on here? Finally, he said to me, he says, you, know, you ought to get married. I says, Rabbi, I have no girlfriend. I have a lot of girlfriends, but I have nobody I want to be living with. Why do you say that? He said, well, I spoke to your doctors. They said you're going to be a cripple. And in uniform, you could get somebody as a cripple. But when you're in civilian clothes, you won't be able to get a wife. Well, that's not true. Because I married one of the most beautiful women in this whole area. I showed quite a few pictures of my wife. She was gorgeous. And I met her when I was on crutches. Because November 30th, 1959, no, 1948, pardon me, I'm mixed up. November 30th, 1948, I turned a car over near Newburgh, New York, five times. I was thrown out of the car, and the car landed on my bad leg, and didn't break it where the boat wreck was, but broke it above it. And you know something? That's how I found Glens Falls. I lived in a furnished room. Didn't even have a closet. I had a rope on the wall that I would hang my clothes. And I was about nine, ten blocks away from where I could eat breakfast. Walk back on crutches. This was January. I could eat lunch, walk back on crutches. Dinner, walk back on crutches. In the winter time, I couldn't do it. I was in Manhattan Beach Veterans Hospital at that time. It's been closed since there's one on Lakeshore Drive now. 
and they sent me up to Mount McGregor, which was a veterans hospital at the time. Governor Dewey made it a veterans hospital in 1947, I think it was. And I was up here for three and a half months, and I fell in love with Glens Falls. After I came out of the, in April, I came back to Brooklyn, and I met my wife. I was on a cane and crutches, but I wasn't too bad. I was in good shape, and the weather was good. And we immediately became a couple. Our first date was June the 3rd. 1948, we got married Thanksgiving, 1948, and I couldn't have been the best for a better wife. She got tuberculosis in 1964, 65, in those days you went away for seven, seven and a half months, and she was in a hospital in New Jersey. And when she came out, I decided to go into the retail business because I didn't want to leave her and be on the road. I was a road salesman. I'd leave on Monday morning or Sunday night and come back on Friday night or Saturday morning. And I opened a store in Lynch Falls, Northway Plaza, Jonathan Reed Limited. And I did it so I wouldn't have to be away from her. And I found out after I did it, I was very good at it. As a matter of fact, I was much better than I thought I'd be. <laughs> I ended up with 17 stores, menswear retailer of the year in 1976 in New York State, president of the menswear retailers of America, which was the United States and Canada, thousands of stores in 1990. I enjoyed it. I was invited down by Wichita State University to set up a course in retailing there, <coughs> which I did. I believed in education. I spent two weeks at NYU from 8 in the morning till 6 at night, six days a week. I went down to Tulane and I took a six-day course, a six-day course there too. And I believed that I didn't go to college because I was always in lock wards and VA hospitals, and city hospitals. And that was the worst time to be in the VA hospitals. Anybody hear a prefrontal lobotomy? Yes. Well, I was there when they were doing it. And I'm sure they think, I said they were all mixed up. But after they got done with them, they left. Uh, we had to play baseball with them. We put them in left field. And they'd stand there and the ball would come by and they'd look at it. Insulin shock treatment. I was playing bridge with my partner who had just had insulin shock treatment and he went into a convulsion and died right in front of me. I haven't played bridge since. <coughs> You talked to a psychiatrist today and you mentioned that the, oh, those were the bad days. They did medication today. They did not help any of the patients. When I found a Alcoholics Anonymous, other than my children, my family, that's the most important <coughs> thing in my life. March the 3rd, I'll have 49 years. It changed my entire life. Well, that's <clears throat> obvious because you went on to become a great success in your life. I lived in the best house in Glens Falls, 18 rooms. I've been in that house, I can attest to that. Seven bathrooms, <laughs> two-story indoor garden on two and a half acres. You made quite a bit with your life. After I joined the VA. Well, you had the help and you had the support and you found it there. Unfortunately, it wasn't a common thing after World War II. I came back to the VA. After the weekend, I found a, a, a fellow, Joe Devlin, God bless him, he's dead. He spent the whole weekend with me in Brooklyn, Fox Slope Group. I came back to the VA hospital and took my psychiatrist, Dr. Har, a woman, and I told her about the weekend. I have post-traumatic war syndrome. 
had a tough time during the war. My mother died from the telegram I was missing in action. My father remarried four days after I came out of prison camp. And I had no place to live. When I met my wife, I had no place to live. My furnished room threw me out because I was having drunken spells. And I don't even remember them. I had a black eye. So a friend of mine who was brought up in an orphanage took me in. He was taking care of a grandmother. He was 10 years in an orphanage. He ended up the second highest civilian in the Air Force. Counsel to the Secretary of the Air Force under Nixon, Ford, and Carter, which is unusual. We're still friends. He had had a football scholarship and he got hurt during the war. He was also a bombardier, but he was in the South Pacific in the D-29s. He's still alive? Still alive. Good. And we keep in touch. My oldest friend just died about a month and a half ago. We were friends for 80 years. That's tough. And uh, I have a lot of friends that are a long time ago. Friends here. Okay, um, at this point, I'd like to ask the audience if we have any questions for <coughs> Simon. I'll relay the questions. You can ask. Go ahead. What was your responsibility for the uh, bomb site in case of your plane going down? In case the plane would go down, what was his responsibility for the bomb site? Supposed to destroy it. Oh. Supposed to destroy it. You had the medic, uh, bomb stuff inside most of them. There was a bomb inside of it? Yes. They were top secret. The Norton bomb site, all this stuff was couldn't fall into enemy hands, so he was supposed to destroy it. And apparently he had a bomb that you could yeah. pull something and... Not enough to make it so that they couldn't do it, you know. Couldn't capture it. And capture it. Another question? Right here. Um, how did you get captured? How did I what? He, he's wondering... <clears throat> well, he told the story about how he was shot down. When do you, do you actually have a recollection of falling into enemy hands, the enemy coming up and saying you're a prisoner of war? I never realized that when I got out of the plane that I was so close to the ground and I was going into the flames of the plane. That's why I climbed my chute and smashed my leg. I could feel the heat of the plane when I hit the ground. About five, six minutes after I hit the ground, I see a chute coming down, and I can see the uniform of an American. And I'm yelling, hey, American, I'm an American also. And it was my radio operator. I didn't recognize him at first, because his face was all discolored. He had been blown out the waste window. The other waste window, the engineer had been blown out, but he was blown apart. He was made unconscious for about a thousand feet, and then he came to it and he pulled a chute. And he took care of me. As a matter of fact, when I left the air raid shelter, I was the last one in it, and I came out on crutches. The ground was full of brick and mortar and things like that. And I was falling, and two guys grabbed me, and one of them was him. They put me on the door, and they carried me to a 16-story building that wasn't completely finished. We took over the eighth floor. We had armed guards, we had all entrances to it. We had our own food. We borrowed $75,000 from the Romanian government and we took care of ourselves. <coughs> and he took me there on the, on the door. He had another guy, I don't know who the other guy was. He died about a year and a half ago in Columbia, South Carolina. James R. Scott. Scotty was his nickname. He was a radio operator. There were three of us that been Milton Jacob Hirsch, who was from Bronx, New York. He had a Jewish sounding name, but he wasn't Jewish. He was Protestant, and then he became, I was there when he became a Catholic. <coughs> And uh, Scott and me. I have had one I've had a wonderful life. I'm sober 
got married six months, I got my family back. My wife and I had a wonderful marriage together. We've been everywhere in the world. All over Europe, North Africa, <coughs> India, China three times. <coughs> Taiwan. Oh. Can I um Nepal, Marrakech, everywhere. Yes. Can I ask? Do you have any more questions? Anybody else have a question? Come on, ask me a question. <laughs> I'll tell you no lies. Okay, we have another question. Go ahead. How was your plane shot down? By an, a fighter or an idiot craft or what? We couldn't keep up with the rest of the crews. Our former, we had to leave the formation. We couldn't keep up with it. We lost our number three engine, started to, to feather it. And uh, we had, didn't have the airspeed the rest of them had. And we were all left alone. And any 109s, Messerschmitt's 109s came at us. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure if there were four or six of them. But all I know is I was calling them out at 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and they shot us down. Because you're The bright. mom went off to bail out. I put on my chute. I handed the chute to my nose turret gunner, and I started to go to the nose wheel to get out, and the plane went into the dive, and I held on, and I said, I got it out, I got it out. It'll be quick, I won't feel it, I won't feel it, I won't feel it. I, no, I don't want to die, I got to get it out, I got to get out. And all of a sudden, the plane goes by me, and I'm out, and the chute goes up, and I don't remember pulling the chute. And I looked up, and there's the chute, and I looked down, and I'm going into the plane, to the plane. So I climbed the chute, and I smashed my leg. Any other questions? Come on, ask me a question. <laughs> By the way, my son is here. He's in the back here, and uh, he takes good care of me. Where's your son? Stand up, John. Hi, John. Hello. Nice to meet you. You said you were next to my son. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you so very much, Sonny. And again, thank you.